Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the Dow 30, as Andy Hoffman calls it, the Dow propaganda average. Um, I think it's going to become very clear with this update that that's exactly what this is. Now, I've pointed out the presidential cycles before. Um, it's kind of been going on since the last three uh, two-term presidencies. Um, we get a, a president on his way out, and as he's on his way out, uh, the market just completely collapses. And, um, you know, he can point to the uncertainty of, of what's going to happen next, or, you know, not on my watch, it wasn't my fault sort of thing, blame the last guy, whatever it is. Uh, it's the same pattern. Um, but you can see that we have uh, the wealth effect now going into reverse, and uh, we have this startling interview with uh, former Fed official Richard Fisher. Um, just, I, I mean, the tone of the interview to me was shocking because he's just kind of casually saying, yeah, yeah, it's all fake. Um, we goosed it up just to create an effect, a wealth effect, but that's pretty much over now. So um, get ready for it to go down big time. Um, so let's, uh, let's listen to the interview. This is an interview with Richard Fisher, and uh, he's a former president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And you can see he retired in 2015. So he's retired now. He's just kind of coming out and telling us, uh, well, that's what happens. And he, you can see he was at uh, the Admiral Farragut Academy, went to the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. Um, so he's obviously insider connected here you go wall street brown brothers harriman uh, former assistant so completely connected but what's really shocking to me about this interview is how he it's almost like he's being a scapegoat for the obama administration or whatever uh just the way he kind of casually says yeah that's uh, yeah that's what's happening so let's uh, listen to the interview i'm going to comment a little bit uh and stop it but I just wanted to hear this interview because it, it was really shocking for me to listen to this. I'll just start playing it here. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. This is, uh, Mr. Fisher, this has been an absolutely extraordinary interview. For you to come on here and, and for you to say I was one of the central bankers who engineered the front loading of the banks. We did it to create a wealth effect. And then to yeah. go on and tell us with a big smile on your face that, pri that we're overpriced, which was the word that you used in the market, that there would be some digestive problems. Yeah. Are you guys going yeah. to take the rap if there is a serious correction in this? No, we're not going to take the rap. It's somebody else's fault. Market, will you equally come on and say, I'm really sorry, we overinflated the market, which is a logical conclusion from what you've said um, so far in this interview. In my opinion, we went one step too far, which is QE3. By March of 2009, we had already bought a trillion dollars in securities. And the market turned that first week in March. To me, personally, as a member of the FOMC, that was sufficient. We had launched the rocket. So I was against it. Of course, we have a, you know, we have a, our committee meetings. We keep all the no, uh, the minutes a secret. We don't release those to the public. So you can't actually see what we're doing while we're doing it. But uh, now I'm going to come back after I've retired and kind of admit to you, yeah, I, I was against it, but mm, yeah, that's what they wanted to do. And yet we piled on with QE3, understandably worrying, the majority did at least, that we might slide backwards. Uh, so I think you have to be careful here and frank about what drove the markets. Look at all the interviews you had over the last many years since we started the QE program, quantitative easing, and it was the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, the European yeah. Central Bank, the Japanese Central Bank, what are the Chinese doing? All quantitatively driven by central bank activity. That's not the way markets should be working. They should be working on their own animal spirits, but they were juiced up by the central banks, including the Federal Reserve, even though some of us would not support QE3. So it wasn't my fault. Uh, I was against it, and uh, they did it against my advice. Yeah, I think we have to bear in mind that what the Fed did, and I was part of that group, is we front-loaded a tremendous market rally starting in 2009, in March of 2009. It's sort of what I call the reverse wimpy factor. Give me two hamburgers today for 
one tomorrow. And <laughs> I'm not surprised that almost every single index you can look at, if you take away dividends in the S&P last year, unweighted was down significantly. And all the other indices were down. The, in terms of the 10-year bond, there was almost no movement for the year. Um, basically, we had a tremendous rally, and I think there's a great digestive period that's likely to take place now. So we're going to have a great digestive period. That's kind of a, a code word, uh, we can say, for um, a bear market. Is this a... Let me get the arrows here. Was this a digestive period here? Well, it's not going to let me add an arrow, but you can see here. Uh, was this a digestive period here where the market topped the NASDAQ uh, bubble burst uh, around 2000 and we pretty much went sideways for six years. Is that a digestive period? Um, so we're going to come back down to around here, uh, lose about maybe, say, a couple trillion in market cap. Um, looks like that's what he's saying. So let's look at this term they used here. It's called wealth effect. And uh, they're telling us that... Uh, well, let's read the definition here. The wealth effect is the change in spending that accompanies a change in perceived wealth. In other words, it's a con game. Usually the wealth effect is positive, spending changes in the same direction as perceived wealth. The effect on individuals. Changes in a consumer's wealth causes changes in the amounts and distribution of his or her consumption. People typically spend more overall when one of two things is true, when people actually are richer, objectively, or when people perceive themselves to be richer. For example, the assessed value of their home increases or a stock they own goes up in price. So uh, that's what they're talking about when they call call this a, a wealth effect. Um, it, it's just uh, shocking to me that they can be this frank. We have um, the beginning of a new year. We get back-to-back -back record losses as soon as the new year comes around. And this is everything that we had been expecting, uh, that the markets are rigged. Now they're just coming out right in your face and admitting, yeah, we pretty much propped everything up for about eight years, and now it's time to let it collapse. And it may continue because, again, we front-loaded at the Federal Reserve an enormous rally in order to accomplish a wealth effect. So I wouldn't be surprised at what's happening. I wouldn't blame it on China. We're always looking for excuses. China's going through a transition. It'll take a while to affect itself. But what's new there? There's no news there. It's well, the I mean, a 7% plunge in their market is, is a scary thing to wake up yeah, to for U.S. investors. In mind, we got to, we got to, you know, I've been going to China since 1979. I was part of Oh, what? You've been going to China since 1979? the group that negotiated with Deng Xiaoping, the normalization of our commercial claims against each other, and closed that deal on March 1st of 1979. So I think I've got a little bit of experience in China. I invested in China for quite a period with my fund in the B-shares market. You have to remember, Shenzhen and Shanghai are basically domestic markets. They're trying to manipulate those markets as much as possible. Jim Cramer was right on this morning in terms of the force that they use to prevent real animal spirits from emerging. Well, I guess then the question... Wait, so he, he's endorsing Jim Cramer for criticizing the Chinese for artificially propping up their markets and goosing their stock markets, but yet he's admitting that that's what the Federal Reserve has done to U.S. markets for the last eight years? This is one of the most incredibly... Uh, proud, uh, just really like a lunatic. Th these people, uh, the way they act, uh, they they literally they have no shame. Um, they, they, it's it's like they have no conscience whatsoever. That they can come right out and and just admit that they've been lying for years. Is how ugly is it going to get? There was a point yesterday where the Dow was down four six seven, and everyone was yeah. trying to how figure out how ugly is it going to get. Pay. He's laughing. Why? Does the Chinese stock market really affect us? If you do see this as this big unwind from Fed policy, which fueled, what, a six-and-a-half-year bull market? What does it That's look right. like on the way down? Well, I was warning my colleagues, don't go wobbly if we have a 10 to 20% correction at some point. The market's still overpriced. Everybody you talk to 
uh, the, all morning long from Byron on, they've been warning that these markets are heavily priced. We're trading at 19 and a half times earnings. We're not having the kind of top line growth we would like to have. We're late in the cycle. Things are richly priced. Uh, when have they been warning about that? I, I haven't heard anybody talking about how the market has been richly priced over the last eight years. All of a sudden, this guy comes out when there's a new year and he tells you, oh yeah, we've been telling you for a long time. I mean, this is like Orwell now. I mean, these people, you know, it, these are the kind of people that make sure that the Wayback Machine doesn't have a cash page of what they said so that uh, they can kind of rewrite history. Uh, all the managers that I talk to in my role at Barclays, and that's quite a few across the world, a lot of people are building cash positions. Uh, the, the rates traders are different, but I'm talking about the long only investors or those that are taking a longer term view are being extremely cautious here. They're raising their cash levels, are nervous about the valuations that are in the market, and they realize the old dictum from Ben Graham and Warren Buffett, price is what you pay, value is what you get, and the values are very richly priced here. So I could see significant downside. I could also see just a flat market for quite some time, again, digesting that enormous return the Fed engineered uh, for almost six years. First of all, I don't think there can be much more accommodation. The, the Federal Reserve is a giant weapon that has no ammunition left. That's a Fed guy saying that. Did you hear that? Federal Reserve... <laughs> is a giant weapon that has no ammunition left. So what I, what I do worry about is it was the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. For, for half of my tenure, which was a decade there, everybody was looking for the Fed to float all boats. And they, in my opinion, they got lazy. Now we go back to fundamental analysis, the kind of work that used to be done, analyzing whether or not a company truly on its own is gonna grow its bottom line and grow its shareholder value and price accordingly. And not just expect the tide to lift all boats. So we are gonna find out indeed, when the tide recedes, we're gonna see who's wearing a bathing suit and who's not, and we're beginning to see that. You saw that in junk last year. You also saw it in, even in the mid caps, you saw it in the S&P stripped of its dividends. You had a, on an unweighted basis, you had a negative return. The only asset that really returned anything last year, again, if you take away dividends, Believe it or not, it was cash. It's 0.1%. Yes. That's a very unusual circumstance. And that's something that we did on purpose. And we just find it absolutely hilarious that uh, all of you people who are, say, upper middle class, who have a tremendous amount of money invested for your retirements in the stock market, yeah, we drove our interest rates down to nothing. So you really didn't have any choice uh, except to maybe try to wait us out for eight years eating dog food. And uh, But now you know what? We Now that we've got you all into the stock market, we're going to go ahead and pull the for, pull the trigger and, and let that thing plunge. <laughs> That's just so funny. We're totally out of time. One word answer. The Fed forecast four rate hikes this year. The market says it'll only be half of that. Who will be right? I thought John Williams' interview was very good yesterday. I bank on that. <laughs> well, he says the Fed is going to go through with their forecast. Richard Fisher, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. The former president of the Dallas Fed. Well, there you go. Um, that's right from the horse's mouth. Uh, they planned this. They've had this planned from the very beginning. I, I've told you about these presidential cycles. Um, it's all about, uh, well, it's not my fault. Um, you know, the animal spirits drove it there. Uh, the market just became overvalued. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure why people were so foolish to be buying, you know, all the way up. But uh, it's, it's going to plunge. It's going to have to digest for we don't know how long. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. So that's absolutely shocking. Uh, this is an article about uh, the Dow versus the S&P and who's the king of the market. We can see here that the S&P has, this was in 2013. At that time, the S&P had roughly a $14 trillion market cap, whereas the Dow 30 had about a $4.25 trillion market cap. Now, uh, it's probably quite a bit higher because, um, you know, in 2013, we were around... Um, about 13,000, 12, 13,000. So it, it's going to be maybe six or seven trillion on the Dow and, and possibly, you know, even 20 trillion is on the S&P 500. But so we're looking at losing anywhere from two to ten trillion dollars in in uh, wealth. But again, that was just a wealth effect. That was just a, that was just us at the Federal Reserve uh, convincing you that you were wealthy when you really weren't. 
Um, it was just uh, fake money that we printed up. And uh, so now when the, the new election cycles coming up here, we, we decided we're just going to pull the plug and uh, we're going to let this thing collapse. And you're going to watch all of your retirements that you've uh, put into stocks because you couldn't get anything into bonds. Uh, we're going to watch that just uh, evaporate right before your eyes. And it, it, it's uh, really quite hilarious. We'll talk to you next time.